Prayer. <laughs> so through prayer, what, what's another way we connect with Christ? Reading his word and sharing with others. Excellent. You guys got an A. You got an A tonight. Amen. So we are so thrilled, Carl, that you're here with us, and we'll turn the time over to you at this time. All right. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Well, good night, everyone. Good evening, I should say. Um, I am glad to see you here, particularly because of the weather that was so awful getting over here. I came up from Chattanooga, and man, uh, it, uh, I felt like my Jeep was going to go off the road, even with four-wheel drive. So it was raining hard. Um, so I'm glad that you were able to... I, I saw the rain, and I thought, wow, how's that going to affect things? But it looks like we got a good turnout, and also we have the streaming. So thank you for all of you who are watching uh, from home as well. But Mark is right. Uh, we did not, uh, he didn't tell me anything about those three things. He just, uh, he just said that he wanted to have me back after one year ago. It was one year ago uh, right now that I was here. We did a, uh, an actual larger series on the three angels' messages. And the idea of digging a little deeper into those, the, uh, what are we supposed to be uh, gleaning from them uh, to be ready, not only ourselves, but to have other people ready for what the book of Revelation tells us is coming. Now, in just the 12 months since I've been here, things have gotten even crazier, have they not? Are you seeing things that you would say, just a few years ago, there's no way you would have seen that? I mean, you're saying that that just wouldn't have happened. There would have been, we all had kind of, a, I mean, when I say we, I mean all people. I don't mean all of one faith or one political party. I mean, all people kind of agreed on certain things. You know, for example, children were kind of off limits. They're the ones you got to protect, you know, keep them safe. Don't, you know, don't do anything that would be confusing to them or anything. And, and you just, you can't believe what's going on. And so I believe that we are even closer uh, than we think to to the second coming of Jesus. And that is our message, to get ready. However, for tonight and for a couple of meetings tomorrow, I did want to take a little bit of a different approach. And the reason I wanted to take this approach, again, without talking to Mark about those three points, was because um, think about your own walk with God and then think about those that you know that are in the church, that go to church every week, that maybe go to church once in a while. And I thought, you know, we can talk about a lot of things. We can talk about the prophecies. We can talk about what the Bible has to say about the seven last plagues and all of the mark of the beast. And these are all important things. We can talk about heaven. I've written a whole book on the subject of heaven. Also an important thing. But I thought, you know, when you think about this idea of having a walk with God and having it be fulfilling, I think that there is a large percentage of us or our brothers and sisters, uh, depending on, you know, maybe we have a, a period of a good walk with God and then it kind of fades. But I think that there's a need for just the idea of the basics of how we connect and stay connected to God. Because if you have that, it's going to make your study of these other things come alive even more so. And so I, I, I thought... You know, I prayed about it, and I thought about some, some of the things the Bible tells us that are practical. So we're going to look at principles, and we're going to look at practicality, and we're going to look at a lot of Bible promises. And so the series is Walking with God in the Final Days. This first one is Walking with God through the Word. And so my goal for tonight is that the idea of opening the Bible is going to be more exciting to you and more real to you than ever before. And because I think that is the key, and once again, for those of you who don't know, I, I, I spoke on this last time, my profession is not a pastor. I actually work at a, a large a corporation, and I work in human resources with regard to leadership development and interpersonal skills and so forth. We, we, we um, do a lot of development of the employees. And so I know a lot of things about uh, interpersonal activities, and I know a lot about what the science says about reading and how you learn and all of that. And one of the things I found is that the science is just now catching up with the Bible. Amen? The Bible told us a lot of these things, and now they're saying, well, did you know that it's better to listen first to others, to understand them, and then tell them you're... 
Well, yeah, the Bible actually says that very thing. Be slow to speak, you know, and, and fast to, pay, to listen and to hear others, but slow to speak, slow to anger. And so, and so what we're going to look at here are things that according to the scriptures and according to science can help us with our walk with God with regard to the Bible and studying the Bible and making it more real. So, we do have a common problem as human beings in a fallen nature, in a fallen world, and that is we get easily distracted. So for the purpose of the next couple days, I want you to think of your walk with God as uh, uh, like a freeway, okay? So heaven is at the end of that freeway, and you're, that's your destination, right? That's where, raise your hand if you want to go to heaven, right? And Jesus, remember Jesus says uh, the kingdom of heaven is, is here, it's, it's within you, and I like to say that when Jesus comes again, that's just moving day, right? We can have a relationship with God and, and have heaven right now. Um, but we have a common problem, and that is that on that highway, that freeway, that expressway, that is our, our journey to heaven, we have these off-ramps that are very appealing. When I was a kid, they're, they, they're, they're bringing them back now, but does anyone remember the Stuckies, the little Stuckies stores that uh, they had along the... And, and I remember... I remember those little uh, Chico sticks. They were like a Butterfinger, except they're round and, and, and uh, cylindrical. And I remember as we were driving down the road on the freeway, when I would see one of those, I wanted to go to that because they had little toys. They had the little, the little, uh, the little road runner thing that, that had the red uh, dye water in it, and it would you put the water in it, and it would sit there and dip. Remember, and it would get a drink, and then go, like, how does it do that? And as a kid, that was magic. I was like, wow, that's so cool. And I loved all those off-ramps. The highway was boring to me. The freeway, uh, you know. And so we, as we get older and become adults, we have a lot of distractions as well, do we not, from this highway. And God says, the expressway that I have for you, the freeway, is so much better than all those side streets with all the potholes that slow you down, and then you wander back, and maybe you get back on, or maybe you get sidetracked into some of these side streets. And that's not what he wants. He wants us to have that fulfilling you know, the high-octane drive, uh, but we have this problem. And so one of the things I want to take off the table in our discussions over the next couple days is something that is brought up a lot, and it's very important, but I'm not, we're not going to go there for this, and that is the subject of salvation. We're not going to talk about, here's these things, and, and have you watch it and go, well, if I don't do that, you know, does that mean, you know, does God insist? Am I going to help? This is all about information that will help you in your walk. That's it. Now, obviously, there's a place. We're talking about your eternal destiny. But, you know, a lot of people, they want to know, I really want something that's going to help me now, right? I'm, I want to go to heaven, but I'm struggling now with just having this relationship with God. Because quite frankly, and here we go, I'm going to say something that some people, either here or watching, are thinking and feeling. Quite frankly, God is good at being a, a savior, and he's good at building mansions and creating universe, but, but I want to have fun. And I just don't see God as being as much fun as all of these other things. And that's what's keeping me back from giving him my full heart. Millions upon millions relate to what I just said. They want to go to heaven. They want a more fulfilled life with God. But they perceive it as maybe a little bit boring and maybe not quite as fun. And so if you're feeling that way, you're not a bad person. You're a very normal person because we are in a fallen nature. We have many off-ramps. So what I want to look at over the next three meetings is a lot of on-ramps. I, I, want, I want the on-ramps to be attractive and the off-ramps to be unappealing because they keep pulling us off this, this expressway. Now, I will say this too. Some of you already have a very fulfilling walk with God. I'm under no delusions that, that this is going to revolutionize everybody and they're going to change everything. Some of you, what we talk about, you probably... No question with a group this size, there's going to be a lot of you that have a fulfilling walk with God. You're very happy. You want more of him, okay? But you're, you're happy that you are spending that time, and that's your favorite part of the day. So we're going to look at practical, biblical solutions to these common problems in these three areas. Time with God in the Word, time with God in prayer, and sharing God with others. That one can be really tricky, and we'll end it tomorrow afternoon with that. And uh, I actually have a couple of miracle stories that I'll share with you on that one. So, think about a plant. Think about a plant. 
What does a plant do, whether it's a, a rose or an oak tree or anything in between, what does a plant do to concentrate and work real, real hard on growing? What does it have to do to just, you know, all that effort it puts into it, right? It has to work at it. It's got steps it has to do, and if it gets those, no. It basically stays connected to the elements around it. That's what, that's what the plant does. If a plant is in the ground and it's getting those nutrients, it just has to stay there, right? Weeds do not like we humans because we tend to separate them from the ground and they, they die, right? Because why? They are separated from one of the elements, which is nutrients. If you put a plant so that no sunlight gets to it, unless it's a mushroom, <laughs> Um, if you put a plant where no sunlight gets to it, that plant will die. It has to have access to the sun. It has to have access to the nutrients in its roots, and it has to have access to water as well. If you don't believe that, then any of your indoor plants neglect it for a while, and you'll find out real quick that it has to have water. And finally, oxygen, air. It has to have air. And uh, one of the things we all as humans love about plants is, of course, as you know, uh, we breathe in oxygen, breathe out carbon dioxide. The plants take in the carbon dioxide and create oxygen. Isn't God, isn't God wonderful? Isn't it great how all that works? It all works together. So I was being facetious when I said, what are the steps, what is the hard work that a, that a plant does? Because they do nothing, right? They just absorb what God gives them. I like the, the, I like the sunflowers that actually turn toward the sun. Isn't that neat? The whole field turning. We have a field out not far from outside of Chattanooga in a town called Udawa that has, that has a whole field. You can go. You can, a lot of people go there to get their pictures made. Um, but it's just it's, it's great to see they're, they're facing toward the sun. And uh, isn't that what we're supposed to do, right? God is the light. The Bible talks about God is the light. And we're supposed to stay. So here's your assignment. Doesn't this sound hard? You're going to stay connected to the source. That's it. That, that's what I'm, I'm going to talk about tonight. Not complicated, but there's a lot of those off ramps. Okay, Bible says in Psalm one. Let's read. Actually, let's read this together because this is a very powerful verse and it, it kicks off what we're going to be talking about here. And there's actually this verse. We're gonna we're gonna um, tap into this verse a couple of times in the next uh, little bit here. So Psalm one, very beginning of the book of Psalms. Psalm one verses one through four. Now, one of the things you'll notice in my Bible here is that it has a lot of colors, this particular Bible. I have other ones that don't, but this one has a lot of colors. That's going to mean something when you leave here. What are all these colors in my Bible? Why do I have a lot of yellow, and I have blue, and I have green? That'll, that'll mean something to you. So Psalms 1, verses 1 through 4, here's what it says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And notice... Our theme is walking with God, and this is talking about walking not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So there is being in touch with the elements, the spiritual elements. That is, he, he's allowing himself to be transformed. Verse 3, and he shall be, now this is, this is key, look at, look, we're thinking about plants here. And he, the one who is described in verses 1 and 2, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also, also shall not wither. And I like that last part. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The Bible in King James, when it uses prosper, it's talking about shall be successful. Shall, it shall happen. It doesn't mean money. It might, but it doesn't necessarily mean like you say someone's prosperous. In our day and age, most things are, are, way, are measured by money. So if a prosperous person uh, is, is, is described, it means rich. This is talking about things that you do. So you are going to go out this after, uh, tomorrow afternoon or Sunday afternoon. You're going to go out and you're going to do something. This is saying that if God is living in you and you listen to him and he, you allow him to guide you, all that you do will prosper. Did everything that Joseph did prosper? Was it prosperous to go into that jail when we know what's on the other end of that jail? What if he had avoided it and never got to where he was going? See, God says, I want you to look at every step of the way as I'm moving you towards something. And yes, 
Joseph was being quite prosperous. And you notice how God linked his plan with Joseph with Joseph's fidelity and his good work ethic. Because when Joseph was, was sold into slavery, that alone would have been depressing enough, right? Sold into slavery. You have this dream that someday people are going to bow down to you, and God showed this to you, and now you're sold as a slave. But he was prospering, right? He was moving toward that goal in a very creative way, right? It's like Joseph was probably thinking, I'd prefer something else, but he was moving toward a goal. And then, and then Potiphar's wife, who no doubt was attractive because he was a very powerful man, she starts to make advances toward Joseph, and Joseph has a choice. He chooses to do the right thing. Why? I will not do this and sin against God. And that puts him even further down. Now he's not just a slave. He's a prisoner. But he says, I'm going to be the best prisoner in this whole place. And God knew he would do that. God knew that when Joseph was thrown into prison, he would say, I'm going to be the best prisoner here. I'm going to do the best job cleaning and whatever I'm asked to do. And they began to notice Joseph, and it says eventually they said, Joseph, you can be over the other prisoners because we see what your work ethic is. We see your honesty level. And he was prospering. Isn't that amazing how God works? Can you imagine if there were, if there were a human being today that you put out a job in a job offer. You said, I want a new employee, uh, and this is not just an employee, but this is an employee who's going to advise me, counsel me, be like almost my agent or my manager to help me make decisions. And this person comes in and you say, well, what are your talents? And they say, well, I can, um, I can see the future accurately all the time. I know the end from the beginning. I can also perform miracles without any problem whatsoever. And I care more about you than you will ever care about yourself. And then they demonstrate all three of these. Would you hire the person? <laughs> he can literally tell you what, you're, what the people that are going against your business are going to do the next day. He'll, he can tell you that. I think you're hired. And yet we have access to one who can do all of that, and we say, ah, I'll figure it out. I, I've got this one. So <clears throat> Christians have for the longest time talked about the basic four. And... I'm focusing on three, and no, it's not because your church chose the same three. That, again, is providential. I'm focusing on three of the four because you are here right now, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the need for you to come here right now. You're doing that. Now, for those of you on live stream, we'll talk later. <laughs> but COVID has caused a lot of people to get very comfortable with, with uh, worshiping from home, right? And I, I, think, I think everyone is in their own place. I'm not going to say what everyone should do because we're not a cookie cutter. But I think that it's important to encourage people to come back, physically come back. And that's about all I'll say about that. So I don't have a lot of, of tips for all of you to get you into the church because I'm literally speaking to the choir because I heard you sing a little bit ago and you sounded wonderful. I'm going to focus on Bible study, prayer, and sharing. So we're going to do the basic three. That's what we're going to be looking at. And I'm going to, and I've prayed a lot about this, I'm going to weave a thread through all three of these meetings with CWP. Now those three initials originally came from my a Bible marking system that I, that I came up with. I prayed about it. I said, I want to get, I really want the Bible to come alive to me. You know, I want it to be something that, that is, uh, I just want to look at it in a different way that gets me to be a lot more hyper-focused on it so I can really see what God is saying. And so I, I realized, as I was going through uh, the Word, that there are really three categories that these things fall into, three main categories. And that is, we learn a lot about God's character, who God is, right? We learn a lot about God's will, and we learn a lot about God's promises. So, the Bible says, on the character point, Jesus said, and this is life eternal, so he's praying to the Father, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Life eternal is what? What did he say? Knowing God. Knowing God. That's life eternal. And so when we look at the Bible and we start to, to read it and, and, and uh, concentrate on it and meditate on it, we're learning a lot about God's character. And we're told that through all eternity we're going to admire his character more and more. Can you imagine that? Just in a trillion years from now, you say, man, I love him even more than I did a million years ago. And a trillion years after that, wow, even more. He's amazing. I'm learning new things all the time. I feel like that, that you can only learn so much about somebody here on earth, right? Those of you who are married, you may have learned more than you wanted to. But you can only learn so much. 
with God and the idea of, of the, the redemption of us, it will be studied through all eternity and we'll keep learning more and more. Amen? That's amazing. So, God's will. Paul wrote uh, to the Colossians in Colossians 4.12, stand, part of that verse is to, to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Stand perfect and complete. God's will is that you be complete in his will. Now, I don't know if, if any of you have read Andrew Murray's writings. He was a Dutch reformer pastor in like the, the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. He uh, has a book called God's Will, Our Dwelling Place. And he was ahead of his time with writing books that had like, like, like these month-long book, like one, you have one chapter uh, per day through the month, like a 30-day like devotional. He was doing that in the 1700s, 1800s. Pretty amazing. He, he would take 30 verses, 30 Bible texts, all that have to do with God's will, and he, and he wrote these little, like, small, now they're pocket books, they're very small. But God's will, our dwelling place, and he makes a great case for this. But Paul says, stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's, that's what he wants for us. And then finally, the promises. In 2 Peter 1, 4, we're told that by these promises, by these promises, we can be partakers of what? The divine nature. Now here's my question. Do you believe it? You don't have to answer out loud. Do you believe that you can be a partaker of the divine nature? That's a powerful promise. That's amazing. You can be a partaker of the divine nature. In fact, there's an ideal you that many of you haven't met yet that's just waiting for you. It's a year from now. It's a month from now. It's tomorrow morning. The ideal you compared to the you of today. I talk about this a lot in our classes that have to do with goal setting. That we don't, you know, doesn't have anything to do with God, doesn't have anything, anything to do with things spiritual. But we talk about how you can reach a lot of these goals. I want to lose weight. Or I want to, I want to start up that business. Or I, I want to get good at this instrument. Or I want to write my autobiography. Or I want to do something. And I keep procrastinating. You know, I, I want to reach this, this, this. I see myself a certain way in the future and I can't seem to reach it. And God sees you in a completely different way in the future as well. He sees you moving closer and closer to the ideal you. Just like an acorn growing up into the oak tree. So here's our road map. In each of these three, we're going to look at some of the problems, some of the challenges that we face as human beings in these three areas. We're going to look at some biblical principles about these things and how, what, is the, what are the engine that drives each of these three. And then we're going to get practical. We're going to get very practical and say, okay, now what are we going to do with this? we got these, these principles. we got these truths. What do we do, though? I'm struggling with what to do. And the Bible tells us some things that we can do that will really, really help us. And then we're going to look at some promises, too. The Bible says that we can live by these promises. We can be transformed by them, so we need to take advantage of them. I like to think of God's promises as a billionaire writing you a check. Can you imagine if you had a multi-billionaire wrote you out many, many checks for hundreds of thousands of dollars each, and you said, eh, I don't feel like cashing those. That's too much work. <laughs> You'd cash them, wouldn't you? You would cash those checks because that's not too much work to go down and uh, would you put that in my account, please? God says, I've got all these promises that can go right into your account, and i got millions of people, in fact, billions that aren't even claiming them. And he says, they could. Wow, they could. So why walk with God? The nuts and bolts of it. Why walk with God? Well, I want to be saved. Now, let's go other than that. We, we all want to be saved. What about, what about now? What about what God has to offer to you? So there are many, many things. I wanted to look at three. Just three, I think all three are very convincing. Number one, peace. One of my favorite verses, and I know a lot of you have this verse memorized, Isaiah 26, verse 3, says, Thou, talking to God, Thou, God, will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Do you believe it? Have you ever noticed how many things in the Bible have to do with just simple faith? Yes, there are some things that, that involve some effort and work, but how many of them involve just literally just saying, I, I believe it? The thousands. And yet you come across these and you say, perfect peace. So I, I actually can have that? And we say, no. That, he's, you, you know the, the donkey, the, the way they get donkeys to, to uh, the, the pull the carts? They put a carrot on the end of a stick and they then dangle it in front of the donkey. 
And so that donkey's always about a foot away from the carrot, and you're tricking the donkey, right? It seems almost mean, because, the don- of course, when they get at the destination, they'll feed the donkey the carrot. But the, carrot, the donkey is, is, wow, this thing's right out of range. And some people think God kind of does that with these promises as well. He says things that he knows won't really happen, but we fall for it. We, we try to be good Christians, and then he, he says no. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says his word is true, amen? It's true. When he says something, he will do it. When God says something, he will and definitely can do it. He can do it. I love reading in the Bible examples of where someone questioned God. It's one of the times that God is pretty consistent. He will appear and say, I'm sorry, what? What, what, what did you say? Right? Remember when Sarah laughed at the idea, God and two angels walking, walking along, and they get to Abraham's place, and Sarah laughs at, you know, God says, Sarah will have a child this time next year, and Sarah was way past childbearing. She laughed, and God stopped. Sarah laughed. Uh, no, she says, I did not laugh. He goes, yes, you did laugh. And remember, Zacharias did the same thing when he was told by Gabriel that Elizabeth, his wife, would have a child. And he gave the same reason. After all that and seeing that how wrong they were for doubting Sarah, because Abraham and Sarah weren't the issue with Sarah getting pregnant. It was that God could work a miracle and make it so she could easily get pregnant. And God could do the same with Elizabeth. And yet, Zacharias says to to Gabriel, Oh, my wife can't have a child. She's, she's well advanced in years. And again, remember you're saying to God through Gabriel, it's too difficult for you. And Gabriel says, <laughs> Zacharias, what did you say? Uh, homina, homina. I said, my wife is old. And Gabriel says, I am Gabriel who stands before the throne of God. Because you didn't believe what I said is true, you will be dumb until the child is born. Zoom. God says, when I say something, don't question it. Don't even use your own weakness as a reason that I won't do what I say. God says to, God says to uh, Israel, to Moses, when Moses says, God, these people are still crying out to you. They're upset about this manna. They're a stiff-necked people, and they're demanding meat. Forgive them, Lord. And God says, they've cried out to me many times. Moses, tell the people they will have meat not just for a day or just for a week. They'll have it until it comes out of their nostrils, until they vomit it. Moses, just for a moment, slipped. And he says, wait a minute. (laughs) All of these, there's over a million people, all of them, we're in the desert. They're all going to have enough meat for that to happen, Lord? Well, what are you going to do? Get all the fish out of the ocean? And God says, Moses, what? (laughs) What did you just say? I said they'd have meat until it's coming out. Yes, I know. But uh, Moses, Moses. And he shifted his focus from the Israelites who were grumbling about how God was giving us this manna and we want meat to Moses. Just for a moment, he said, Moses, is the Lord's arm shortened that he cannot do exactly what he says he will do? You will see that I will do exactly what I said. He didn't say they will see. Now he says, Moses, you will see that I will do exactly as I said I would do. And he sent the quail through there, and they were grabbing them, and they were eating until it came out of their nostrils. God says, when I say something, folks, this is the key to walking with me. Don't turn around and say, you can't do it. Even if you say, you can't do it through me because I'm too weak. Right? Can you imagine telling the wife of a wife beater that God can't give that man the ability to stop beating her? because he was forgiven at the cross, so it doesn't matter what he does now. Tell that to the wife. Tell that to somebody who is cheating on their taxes, that it doesn't really matter what they're doing. God can't give them victory over that cheating on their taxes. And all of your fraud, don't worry about all that. God says, I'm sorry, what? (laughs) I can give you victory over any sin if you hand it over to me. And so God says, I will... That will keep, I will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on me. Now, this next one, pleasure. It seems interesting that this one would be something that God would talk about on the earth because we think Satan has sort of a monopoly on pleasure, do we not? I mean, after all, God is the one that's all straight and narrow and boring, and Satan has all the... Did you know that Satan didn't invent one pleasure? He perverted many of them. He didn't invent one. 
Not one. There's not a thing you can name that Satan invented that brings us pleasure. In fact, did you know that when you, and those of you in the medical world know this, all the drugs that people take and get hooked on because they can get that feeling, those drugs aren't doing anything for them. The drugs are causing the drugs that were already in them that God put there, the serotonin, the dopamine, the oxytocin, those are what are flowing. The drugs are causing them to flow. And if you get too much of that, you can get to the point where the dopamine won't flow anymore. Meth can make it so that you actually get holes in your brain, tiny little holes. And they'll close up, but they will never heal. They'll just close. And they can reopen again if you get back on meth. And I've seen testimonials of people who said, I can no longer feel happiness. The dopamine will no longer work for me. Even if I have my favorite food, I go to my favorite sporting event, I do all the things I loved, gone. And God says, I created and I invented pleasure. And the Bible says in Psalm 1611, let's read that. We were just in Psalm 1. Let's read Psalm 1611. This is an interesting one. Again, when you're talking about the things that God wants us to know, it seems odd that he would bring this one up, but this is what he says. Psalm 16 and verse 11 God makes something very, very clear to us. The inventor of pleasure that has since become perverted, but he invented it. Here's what he says, Psalm 1611. Thou will show me the path of life in thy presence. Oh, there we go again. Remember, stay connected to the elements. That's, that's what God is asking you. Stay connected to the elements. The sunshine, the water. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Do you believe it? Now, if you believed it, here's what you're going to, this is a theme I'm going to have over and over again. Simple question. If you believe that in his presence is the fullness, fullness of joy, where would you be going as often as possible? So all you got to do is you got to look at this last week. Think about it. Think back to last week, last, Saturday, last Friday night, till now. And then how often were you getting in his presence? That will tell you how much you believe it. That, that will tell you. These are easy, easy things to understand. So, is the fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. When Jesus ascended to heaven, where does it say he went? To the right hand. Mm -hmm. You mean, hold on, this is starting to make some amazing sense here. You mean that, that if I get to know God, and I get to know Jesus, that that will make it so that I have pleasure in actually having a relationship with him. That, that can be that enjoyable? Wow. See what happens? You start putting different Bible texts together and they start making sense. Psalm 27 verse 4 says this. Now this is King David talking. And remember, David had access to all the money he would ever need. He had access to power. He had access. He had fame. He had a military might. At that time, he was at the pinnacle of a kingdom that had conquered other nations. He had all those things. And this is what he said, Psalm 27 verse 4. He says, one thing, one thing have I desired of the Lord. And this is someone who had, again, money. Unlimited women, unlimited music, unlimited power. He had all that. And he says, no, no, no. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after. Remember that word seek. We're going to come back to that in a minute. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after. That I may, here it is, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Why? Why would he want to do that? He says why. All the days of my life to, here it is, to behold the Lord. In other words, there it is, to be in his presence. Remember our tree, stay connected to the elements. That's what he wanted. He wanted to behold the Lord and inquire in his temple. I want, David says, to hear God's counsel. I want to inquire, God, what should I do here? What should I do there? You are the guy that I want in my life because every time I've followed you, it's led to the greater things in life. And when I've gone against you, it's been disappointing. And so he wants to behold God and inquire of God. That's what he wants. Now, I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. I don't know if you have anyone here that enjoys C.S. Lewis's writings, um, but he wrote this, and his summary of it was that we... Is there... How long has that been out? Did it just go out, or has it been out for a while? Ten minutes? Ten minutes. Hold on. Fifteen. Was it ever on? <laughs> it was on. Wow, okay. See, this is important because 
You're hearing it, okay. Okay. But, you kind of need to see some of these things here. Huh. There we go. All right. I'm just going to leave this other one out because I think when this gets two in the port, that may be it. I'm thinking two of these mess it up. We'll see. No? Yes, it happened last year. Okay. Well, I will read it to you then. I will read you. See, I had some great graphics here too. And I'm saying, do you see this? Do you see that? And you're all like, okay, keep talking. All right, this is C.S. Lewis. And this is what he, this is what C.S. Lewis says. First of all, his summary is that we are, we are far too easily pleased. That's his, that's his conclusion. Now, you may say, wait a minute. Why would, why would anyone say that we, human beings, are far too easily pleased? It seems like we are always wanting more and more and more. And C.S. Lewis is saying we're far too easily pleased. And I want to share with you this quote of what he means by that. So, timing may be just right here. Come on. I think it's going to go. There we go. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Well, let's see. It's wanting to go back and there we go. All right. So what, read the quote with me here. You don't have to read it out loud, but he says this. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires, our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Did you hear that? We're fooling around with all this stuff that is actually down here. It's so small compared to what God offers us now, not just in, in heaven. He says, we are fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Isn't that an interesting way of looking at it? Because we always look at ourselves and go, you can't please us. We always want more, more, more. We can never have enough of all these sinful things and, and all, of these, all these things on earth, and we want more. And he says, no, actually, you're settling. That's, you're too easily pleased. You should be saying, I don't want just these things. I want more. And that more is, of course, God. God is the ultimate. He's the ultimate. And everyone here can find that out. There's not a person on earth. This is the great thing. When we get to heaven and with judgment books are open and we look through that, we'll see that there wasn't a single person who couldn't have experienced that God is the most amazing thing on earth. The most amazing. It's there for us. All right. Finally, the prosperous life. Now, again, I want to use the biblical definition here. I don't, I'm talking about the getting rich life. Psalm 32, 8 says that I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Think about that. I will guide you with my eye. That's how you can be prosperous in all that you do, just like it says in Psalm 1, verses 1 to 4. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 is a verse that I taught my kids to memorize. I wanted them to learn it, and they know it. They know it and several others, but this is one of the ones that they know. Trust in the If you know it, say it with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Do you believe that? Do you acknowledge him in everything? Or is it just when you need a miracle and say, okay, Lord, I need that thing now. Or do you acknowledge him in things that you say, Lord, I've done this many times, but I'd really like you to guide me. You know, I, I, I see, I have a career choice to make. I think I got this, but wait, this is what you want because you know the future. I don't. He says, if you acknowledge me, I will direct your paths. If we actually believe this, I, this is something I like to do. Sometimes I'll find a Bible text and I'll say, what if everyone in the church said for the next year, we believe this verse, come what may. We'll just, just pick out one. How about this one? No matter what, we're going to believe that in all our ways, if we acknowledge him, he'll direct our paths. And we gave him one year of just that verse that we believe with all our hearts. Can you imagine what it would do to the church? Can you imagine how it revolutionized everything? One verse. Just say, that one I'm going to believe. No reservations. 
And there's thousands of them like that. And then, that's for the instruction and guidance that makes us prosperous. And then you've got, we already read Psalm 1, verses 1 to 4, that in all he does, it will prosper. The one who is who, who follows in God's counsel, the one who says, oh, how I love thy law, right? That's the one that will be prosperous in all that he does. So, we're talking about walking with God. What a better place to look at then than Enoch, right? Now, we know Jesus walked with God, but Jesus, some, some could say, well, Jesus was God, so, uh, we, you know, he, he, he was different. We're going to look at Enoch. So Enoch walked with God, and I don't know if you've heard the story a little boy told one time, but they asked him, they said, Johnny, what do you think it meant that Enoch walked with God? And then it says, and, and God took, and he was no more, for God took him. How did that happen, Johnny? And Johnny said, oh, I know what happened. And I really like this because the kid was speaking out of ignorance, but it has a great spiritual lesson for us. He said, I know what happened. He said, Enoch would go out and he would walk with God, and, and then the, he would go back to his home, and then he would go the next day and he'd walk with God, and they'd go a little further, and then he'd walk back home again. And he said, and finally one day, Enoch and God were such good friends that that Enoch walked even further, and they went further and further, and finally God turned to Enoch and he said, Enoch, you know what? We're actually now closer to my home than we are to yours. Let's just go to my place. Isn't that awesome? Now, is there going to be a generation of people in the very near future, according to Revelation, that God will say, you know what? You people are a lot closer to my house than you are this old earth. Let's go. Let's go. That is what we're promised. Absolutely. Absolutely just like Elijah experienced it, and just like Enoch experienced it. There's going to be a generation that experiences that very thing, and God's going to say, let's go. No death for you, let's go. Wow. But how did this happen that Enoch was told in a figurative way, let's just go back to my house, and God took him, and he did take him? Well, the Bible says a couple of things about Enoch. Let's turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and let's look at a couple of verses here. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to learn a little bit about Enoch here. We're going to come back to Enoch over the next couple of days. But if you look at Hebrews 11, verse 5, is talking about Enoch, and it says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony. That he pleased God. If you have a walk with God, you're already pleasing him just to the degree that you're having that walk. That is, for God, that is right there an important thing. You're, you're seeking out God. You're having that relationship with God. You're saying, God, you matter to me. And, and Enoch pleased God. But, but I want you to look at the next verse because this is one we're going to dwell on for just a minute here. In verse 6, it says, Right after we see that he pleased God, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, now this, is, this means Enoch pleased him, but here's how he did it. He that cometh to God must do two things. Did you know that? It says there are two things. He that cometh to God, verse 6, must first believe that he is. Raise your hand if you believe that God is. Okay? I will not ask you to raise your hand on this second one, and you're about to see why. Must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'm not going to ask you if you believe that. You know why I'm not going to ask you if you believe that? Because there's a real easy way to know if you believe that. This is a very faith-heavy seminar this weekend. We're going to talk a lot about faith, not as much about works. I'm asking simple faith questions. Do you believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him? Now, there is a real easy test. And God has given this test to every one of us. We can self-diagnose real quickly. And that is this. If we believed that God would reward us, however he sees fit, for diligently seeking him, what would we be doing with all of our spare time so that others could not pull us away. What would we be doing? We'd be diligently seeking him. And if we didn't believe that he would reward us 
for being diligent in seeking him, guess what we wouldn't do? If I told you that if you go up on this roof right now, in the rain, I'm going to give you a check for $1 billion if you go up on that roof. And I mean me, Carl Martin's offering you that. Not one of you would go up on that roof, and there's a really good reason. <laughs> you don't have to know my bank account to know that the odds of me having a billion dollars are super slim, and if I were smart enough to attain a billion, I wouldn't be dumb enough to give it to you for going on the roof. So you know that there's no reward at the end of that promise, right? You know that, and therefore, you would not go where? You wouldn't go up on that roof. Because here's something I brought up one year ago when I was here, and I want to see how it has affected you in the last year, because this is one of the most important truths in all Scripture. And here it is. You always do exactly what you believe. Always. Now, you may look back and regret. That's different. That's the you of yesterday. And you may look forward and declare, like Peter did, I will not deny you, but that's the you of tomorrow. But the you of today always does exactly what you believe to be best. There are no exceptions. When Paul says in Romans 7, that that I would do, that I don't do, yes, because Paul is looking at the Paul of tomorrow saying, I want to be this way, just like Peter did. I won't deny you. And then he failed. And he says, why am I doing this? But Paul in the moment was doing exactly what he believed because no one has a superpower overtake them and cause them to do things that they don't want to do. You don't have... You don't have somebody saying, uh, you know, I couldn't help but cheat on my taxes because as I was filling out, suddenly my finger started putting zeros on there that shouldn't have been there. and I just couldn't stop it. I don't know what's going on. It's amazing. In fact, here's the challenge I put out. You may remember this from last year. If I were to give you 60 seconds right now, 60 seconds, and I said in the next 60 seconds, I'll give a $100 bill to anyone who can do other than what they believe to be the best thing they can do during those 60 seconds, go... At the end of those 60 seconds, not one of you could do other than what you believe is the best. Not one. You couldn't do it. You say, wait a minute, what if during those 60 seconds someone pulls out a pen, stabs himself in the back of the hand, and says, ow, give me the 100 bucks. I would say, thank you so much for proving my point. Because you obviously decided that in order to get that 100 bucks, the best thing you could do would be to prove me wrong by stabbing your hand. Therefore, you proved me right, and you're not getting a penny. Because no matter what you do, you cannot help but always do what you believe to be the best. You've never been unfaithful to it in the moment. If I gave you a week, and I said, church, I'll come back in a week. And in a week, I want you to write down a list of things you did that were what you did not believe were the best thing you could do in that moment. At the end of the week, I come back, you would all have blank papers. Not one of you could prove me wrong. If I gave you a month, if I gave you a year, if God gave you a lifetime, you would never be able to say, well, I did this. Someone says, no, wait, Carl. I, I used to smoke, and when I was smoking, I knew it was not the best thing for me to do. So therefore, you're wrong, and I want that $100. So let's look at this for a moment. The act of smoking. You say, mm, I'm puffing away at this. I know the nicotine is hurting me. Probably going to cut away eight minutes of my life or more. Uh, but you do believe it is the best thing to do. Absolutely you do. Because you weigh the feeling of the nicotine going to your brain and making you feel a certain thing with the you of 95 years old dying eight minutes earlier in the nursing home. And you say, mm, I'll take that. It's worth it. How do we know this? Because if I put a gun to your head and I said, you take one more puff, I'll pull the trigger, suddenly it would be worth it to stop smoking. But while you're doing this and you know all about what it's doing to your lungs, you fully believe that that is the best thing to do with that cigarette. Fully. Because it feels good and it's worth it. And so God says, He that cometh to me must believe that I am and that I am a rewarder of them that diligently seek me. That's a faith issue. That's a faith issue. And so God says, test me on this. Test me. Come on, seek me. I've never lied. Seek me, and I will show you that I will reward you in ways that you can't even begin to comprehend. Now, some of you may remember the, the, the little analogy I gave to this to test this theory. But without faith, we just read that verse, it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe two things, that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
Uh, even the devils believe and tremble that he is. But that reward thing, that's tough. If you want to know what you think really rewards you, then all you have to do is look, look at your house and in your bedroom and look around at where you spend your time. Those are the things that you do believe, you fully believe, will reward you. There's never been an exception. And you may remember last year when I was here, the gold card test. So with the gold card, the idea was this. You have a gold card, and it's a test that they're doing. The banks are doing this test with only 10 people. And those 10 people, they're saying, this gold card will give you $300 at any ATM machine that has the same symbol as the gold card. But only 10 of them will do that. Are you listening? I want you to, th I want, we're, I want you to think. We're going to be thinking a lot over the next couple of days. So you got this gold card, and this gold card is going to give you how much at each ATM? $300. And how many ATMs are there that have this symbol? 10. You don't know where they are. You've got to go find them. So what is 300 times 10? There's our mathematicians. <laughs> it's 3,000. What's 3,000 times 30? 3,000 times 30. 90,000. So you're making 90,000 a month for doing this. Anybody here making that right now? Let's go ahead and let us know because we got some requests <laughs> for you. 90000 a month for all you got to do is get up and go to the ATM machine. Now, this one's really going to strike home, and I even this one even strikes to me. It strikes to anybody because this is the one of the few examples that you can actually get a measure of how you feel about God. You get an actual measure. So you're going around, and you, you're hunting. How many of you would say it's not worth my time? That's going to take me several hours. I don't have several hours to make 90000 a month. That's just too much trouble. I'm going back to my old job. You would find the time, would you not? Oh, yeah, you'd get in your car, you'd figure it out. And then finally you get in the groove, and so you know what these 10 machines are. So now you're, in a ro you're, you're kind of in a routine of you go, and you get the money, and then you go home, and you, you put it in your bank, and you, you, day after day, and you're getting richer and richer and richer, and you're saying, wow, this is amazing. Okay? Now, why are you going to the ATM, ATM machines? One reason only. Why? Because you believe they will reward you handsomely. You fully believe it. Now let's say I take the, the, those banks and say, we're going, to test, we're going to test something different here. We're going to, we're going to change uh, the time that you can go get that money. And now instead of it being any time throughout the day, you have to get it from the hours of 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. Those are your two hours to go. And so that means you've got to get up. You have to set your alarm. How many of you would say, oh, you know, I need my sleep? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I like to sleep, and that's too much hassle. I'll go back to my old job. Raise your hand if you just throw that. I mean, that's a, that's a million dollars a year, right? It's, it's a, over a million dollars a year. Ten months would be 900000 Two more, over a million. So, so if, I, if I lowered it, if, I, if we change the time frame to 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., my guess is we'd have 100% uh, uh, compliance. What if we, lo what if we changed it to, to it's only going to be from, you know, 2 a.m. to 4 a.m.? Oh, you'd set that alarm? You would set that alarm. Because you believe that those ATM machines will, will reward you if you diligently seek them. Now, here's where it gets scary. Watch this. We're kind of in the group. We understand where we're going. Now, the, the bank says, we're going to lower the, the value that you get out each time. Now you can't get a three, $300 out. Now you can get only um, $100 out of each machine. And you still have to go from, 4 to, uh, from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. Would you still go? Because now instead of making, you're, now you're only making 300 and some thousand a year. Free money. Would you still do it? Most of you would. 300,000 for just getting up for a couple hours a night and go back to bed? Oh, yeah. Now what if I changed it to only $50? And then I go down to 20 and, and 15. Now here's the question. How cheap would I have to make that card? Here's where it hurts. Here's where it really strikes home. How cheap would I have to make that gold card in order to be to the same level of time and seeking that we give to God. How cheap would that card have to get down to? A dollar? Fifty cents? Maybe only if we move the clock to back to maybe convenient hours? So I ask you again, think about it, don't answer it out loud. Do you believe that God will reward you for diligently seeking Him? And God's goal is that as you learn some of these things that we're going to talk about over the next couple of days, that you would give it a chance and find out so that you can honestly say, yes, 
I do believe it because I experience it every day of my life. Amen? Amen. That's what we want. So, seeking God. The Bible has 55 areas, 55 facts about seeking God. And if you go to my website, I'll put it right up here. One of my websites is godforgod.com, G-O-D-F-O-R-G-O-D.com, and you click on a tab called Resources, you will see all 55 of these things that you get for, for seeking God, right? When he says he'll diligently reward you, these aren't 55 Bible texts. These are 55 things that have way more than 55 Bible texts. Some of them have three or four each. 55 facts about seeking God. So let's look at a, a few of them here. Um, they that seek the Lord, Proverbs 28, 5 says they understand all things. Do you believe it? Do you, do you believe you would understand all things? Because he said it. How many of you want to not understand much of what's going on? <laughs> you, you want to be clueless. You like the idea of people fooling you easily. And uh, No. How about Psalm 69, verse 6 says that they that seek the Lord will not be confounded. How would you like to not be confused and confounded? You like that feeling of confusion, sort of that daze that goes across your, your mind when you're not sure what's going on? How about this? 2 Chronicles 14, 7 says, They that seek the Lord shall find rest, real rest. They that seek the Lord shall be delivered from fear, Psalm 34, verse 4. Now, this last one here, and again, this is only just a few out of, there's more than 10 times this on my website. This one is very interesting. When God looks over the earth, it doesn't say he's looking for those who obey, although he is, but it doesn't say that. He's not looking for those who obey, and he's not looking for those who love him. Wow, you'd think for sure that would be it. No, no, the Bible says in Psalm 14, 2, that when God looks across the earth, and he looks at all 8 billion, you know, we're at 8 billion now, right? He looks at 8 billion, he's looking for something. And it says that he's looking to see who is seeking him. Wow. Do you think he's going to diligently reward you when he's looking for that very thing? Oh, look, he's seeking me. Hey, angels, come here, look. He's seeking me. She's seeking me. It's a huge deal for God. Huge deal for God, and for good reason. So the Bible says Enoch walked with God. He pleased God. He sought after God, and we're told there's a book called Our Father Cares. I think words it really well. I think it words this really well. It says that there are Enochs in this our day. A lot of people think, well, that was fine for thousands of years ago. But now, in this day and age, aren't we good at this making excuses? In this day and age, i got too many distractions. Yes, you do. Those are off-ramps, right? And we're wanting to get those off-ramps to be unattractive and the on-ramps to be more attractive. So, when you study the Bible, keep this in mind. The Bible says in Romans 12, 2, be therefore not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, if I take a piece of clay and I shape it into a mold, I'm, that clay is being conformed into the mold. It's, it's the same material, but it's conforming into that mold. If I take that same piece of clay and I turn it into gold, <laughs> I've transformed that clay into something else. The Bible says we will be transformed, not conformed. We will be changed completely. Changed completely. Now, look at this. The same power that brought the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. There's a book called Education, simple title, but it has a lot of good advice in it, and I like the way this is worded. Listen to this. And we know this is true because the Bible tells us that God spoke and it happened. It says this, The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. The word, This word imparts power, Watch this. It begets life. Those of you who want to have, start having a walk with God, look what's waiting for you. It actually begets life. Every command is a promise, accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. Wow. It actually God's life is coming into your soul. Just like our, our song that we had that was beautiful. Wasn't that song beautiful? It says, it's not me, but Christ in me that did it. I will, I, will, I will declare that it was Christ that did it in me. It says, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul into the image of God. Do you believe it? See how important faith is? This is why the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. We, we talk a lot about works, which we should. But boy, if you start digging deep into faith, you realize, well, I think maybe I'll go back to that work stuff. Because faith is actually, that's even more shocking. That, these things that we're told, we, 
that too good to be true. In other words, the Bible, as you're reading it, does the work in you. It begins to transform you and change you. The Bible says in James 1.4, Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire or complete, wanting nothing. It's like when you have a house being remodeled. And you say, when are they going to get done? Those guys that are hanging the drywall are taking forever. Be patient. Let the drywall hangers do their perfect work. They'll take care of it. And God says, when I'm transforming you, let me do my work. And sometimes I'll put you through a trial that has patience involved. And that patience is, is doing that work. He says, let it do its work. Let it do its work. Now, by beholding, we become changed, the Bible says as well. 2 Corinthians 3.18, you know that verse. By beholding, we are changed. The Bible doesn't just say by beholding the word of God, we are changed. It says by beholding. So, does the world have things it wants you to behold that will change you into the world, that will conform you into the, their image? Now, what if you're saying this? Well, that doesn't affect me. That's fine for all of you people, but I can watch and listen to whatever doesn't affect me. Well, the Bible says it absolutely does. It absolutely affects you. It affects us all. Now, someone might say, well, you know what? Studying the Bible is just too boring. You know? I, I, I've got movies. I've got TV shows. I've got a lot going on. I, I just, studying the Bible is boring. So let's get practical here. Let's get practical. I want to talk about the practicality here. This is something that I think that you will find to be helpful to you, to be beneficial. This is my, a Bible marking system that I've been using, and this is why I said at the end of this we would see why these colors matter. Okay, so in my Bible, I've got many places where you will find green and red and yellow. See it right here. There's more of it there. There's... So here's, here's the way this works. A lot of times when we read the Bible, we feel like, you know, I've read this verse so many times, my eyes just get glazed over, and I, I just kind of, it kind of goes past me. What you do is you get a Bible and you make sure you have thick pages so that it won't bleed through too easily. Go to the Bible store and get one that's got thicker pages. When you come across a piece of, the, of a passage that has to do with God's character, God's character, you highlight it in yellow. Okay? When you come across a passage that has to do with God's will for you or God's will for his people, you highlight it in blue. And when you come across a place where it talks, where it's giving you a promise, you highlight that in green, okay? So you've got yellow, God's character, blue, God's will, green, God's promises. Now, I also use orange for when it's something that, that is just some unusual thing, some Bible story about Jericho or something. I say, I don't want to forget that. I'll just, I'll just highlight it in orange. But now this is powerful for a couple of reasons. First of all, when you get to a verse like this, this is the most famous verse in all scripture, even at football games, they'll hold this up, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You begin to, that's where your eyes begin to get glazed over and you say, I know this, I know this. But look at this. If you begin to use the coloring method and to, to let your brain separate the pieces, you begin to see for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son is God's character. And you can think about that. Wow, that's what God is like. And then it says, whosoever what? Believeth in him. Oh, it's God's will that I believe on his son. And this is all through scripture. This is one. And here's the promise in green. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what I get for believing on his son. Okay, now that makes sense. And so not only does it slow down your Bible reading so that you're taking verse by verse and letting it become a part of you, but you're also now having it so that when you go home and you open your Bible, let's say you're tired, you've had a hard day at work, and you say, oh, I'd, I'd love to just read passages that are about God, God's character. I, want to, I just want to read about how wonderful he is. Open up your Bible, go to all the yellow passages. Just look, read yellow. Or maybe you just want to read some promises, just look for green. So this is a way that your Bible can come alive, but it's also going to help you memorize verses a lot more easily. The Bible says in Isaiah 28, verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. This is something that I want to share with you will be exciting, and many of you have experienced this, but if you haven't, I'm telling you, this is what's, you're going you're gonna to love this. When you start to do what I'm talking about here, whether you use the marking method or not, but the marking method was, is going to help. You're going to find a Bible verse over here in Psalms that you say, that makes sense. I like that. I like what I, what I learned there. And then you'll be reading a couple weeks later, and you'll find something 
in the book of you know First John, First John chapter one, whatever, and you'll say, well, wait a minute. Now I see that this truth, it's like algebra, A plus B equals C and so forth. This truth and this truth, when you put them together, creates another truth that you don't see when they're apart, right? It's like when you mix green, I mean, when you mix yellow and blue, only when they're together do you see green. You will not see green separately. And you're going to start seeing these truths build up that you never saw before. And guess what's happening? The Bible is doing its work in you. It's changing you. And it's like you're building up a, your character. God's creating his character in you with the, all these truths that you're discovering by studying God's word. It is exciting. It's amazing. So I want to close with just a few more tips that I think will be helpful. I think this, this Bible marking has helped me more than anything. I mean, I now look forward to going into the Bible more than I ever have because I'm, I'm seeing it in a whole different way. So obviously, technology is a big distractor. Right? When we have a lot of technology, it can cause us to be uh, wrapped up in that and not so much in the Bible, but we, we can get Bible on audio, right? We have apps now, free apps. You can be walking, jogging, working around the house and listen to the Bible. Another good tip is to get an accountability partner. Again, I said science. We talk about this in the corporate America. When you're trying to reach goals, get an accountability partner and keep each other in alignment. When you want to read the Bible, have a group or an individual. Maybe it's your spouse and you, some, some a friend. We're going to meet back here every whatever, every Wednesday, every whatever, and we're going to talk about this section of Scripture. It's going to keep you digging in the Word. Set up zones or times where your family knows, look, from, you know, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. or whatever, after we eat, that, that's my time. That's my time alone with God. That's my time, and I do it regularly. If you're having trouble uh, looking up words like you don't have a concordance or you're, you want to find out more about what the Bible says about any topic, these are two great resources. BibleGateway.com is excellent. It has every version of the Bible you can imagine and also BibleHub.com. It will also give you massive amounts of cross-references. Now speaking of that, get a Bible with wide margins. You can see here, I've got all sorts of stuff written there. These are extra wide margins. I create my own cross-references. They're all through here. It's written in pencil, so you can't see it very well. But when you start writing, when you start giving yourself these cross-references of verses that you found over here and it ties into over here, I'm telling you, you're going to learn it. And this is both scriptural and scientific. You will learn it in ways that it, you, you will not forget it as quickly. You won't. And finally, another suggestion is get yourself a one-year Bible. You've seen these, right? It'll tell you exactly how much to read each day if you want to get through your Bible in a year. And you're going to feel so good as you're going through it and you're seeing those colors start to light up your, your Bible. So, we have the you of today, wherever your walk is with God. Perhaps you have a pretty strong walk with God. Perhaps your walk with God is, is lacking and you want to get it stronger. And you want to become that ideal you, the one that God wants you to be. Did you see, is this one of the pictures you didn't see? Because this was up there before. All right. See, I'm sitting here talking, thinking you're seeing the little acorn and all the stuff I spent time getting. So there it is. You got to see it now. Um, the you of today is, is, is something you've got. Let me put it this way. There is an ideal you that you picture. You think of what you want. You want to be that person. God says, I'm going to help you get there. I will help you be that ideal you. I'll close with this story, and then we'll, and then we'll have prayer. There is a legend that goes something like this. There was a, a man a couple hundred years ago in the times of, you know, the pioneers and the frontiers and all that kind of thing, and, and um, he was in a gang of people, young men, a gang of young men that were, a lot of them were American, a lot of them were Mexican. And they got into a lot of trouble regularly, and they finally had committed so many crimes that the, that the police were always on the lookout for them, right? They just, they did a lot of bad things. And so this one guy, his, his gang that he hung out with, and again, these were some Mexican kids and some American kids, they committed, they committed a crime that caused them to um, get into more trouble than they ever had before, and this man was falsely accused of doing it. Very serious crime, and so it meant he was going to be in jail for a long time in Mexico, right across the border. And so 
when he was thrown in jail falsely, think of Joseph, right? He was thrown in jail falsely, and an elderly Mexican man had known him as he was growing up over the years, because he, had knew, he, he was uh, very aware, aware of some of the others in this, this gang. And he came to visit him, this elderly man, and he's, he, he, uh, the man said, I was falsely accused. I can't believe I'm in here. And the elderly Mexican man says, here, I understand. I've been praying for you. I know you didn't do what they're saying you did, but while you're in here, I want you to read this Bible. And the man said, oh, read a Bible? The, man was never very, the young man was never very religious, but he thought, even if there was a God, why would he allow this to happen to me? Yeah, sure, sure, old man, I'll read this thing. And the man says, okay, thank you. He says, wow. He says, uh, look, God has even taken care of you in here. You've got a nice window. You've got a window that you can see out. And he goes, ah, a window I can see? The only thing I can see out of that window is my own country. It's just off in the distance that I'm apparently never going to get back to. So thank you for the silver lining, but I'm still stuck in this jail. And the old man said, just promise me that you'll open the word. Just promise me that you'll open it and read it. And he says, because no matter how bad your circumstances, God can set you free from any of this. He said, why should I be set free? I was innocent. I didn't do any of this. Please, just leave me alone. So the old man left. Eventually, the old man died. And the young man was in there. And as the years went by, he got more and more angry about the fact that God had allowed him to stay in there. And he began to doubt God more and more. And the, the words of the old man saying, just open the Bible and, and you can be free, kept roaming around and around in his head. The Bible had by that time been gaining dust in the corner underneath his cot. The man said, the young man was like, no, it's not for me. And the years rolled on and rolled on and rolled on. Till, and the Americans kept trying to figure out a way to get him back, and they were negotiating with the Mexicans, and they weren't getting anywhere. He had about given up. And by this time, he was getting close to being an old man. But finally, the American government and the Mexican government decided that they would look at the evidence, and they found out that this man was going to get to go free. This was decades later. And so the man was like, man, I can't believe it. I'm finally going to get out of this place. He said, gather up your things, let's go. So he goes and he gets the few things he had and he looks underneath his cot and there's that Bible. And the Bible, he had not opened it up one time in all those decades, never opened it. So he said, oh, well, a lot of good that thing did me. And as he pulled on it and yanked it toward him, all of a sudden there was a sound of clanking on the concrete floor. And he looked back and what had fallen out of that Bible was a very small file, a metal file that the old man had put in there. And he began to think about how just in his view was a place that would have accepted him knowing he was innocent, and he would have had access to that had he just opened up that Bible years and years ago. And he realized, yeah, I may be free now, but what could I have had? Basically, now he was on plan Z, God's plan Z for him instead of God's plan A or B. And God is offering all of us here, all of us, those watching at home and those that are here in this, in this building, peace beyond what we can possibly imagine. He's offering us pleasure that will give us what we, what we want in an honest and true sense of pleasure, the one that is centered in his own son, and he's offering us a prosperous life. And the question is, are we going to open up that Bible and start that, or are we going to wait years and years until we're at plan Z in our life? God says, I want you to be that ideal you now. He says, let's start working on that. Amen? Amen. All right. Raise your hand if you want to be a part of that group that's going to go to heaven soon as the ideal you. All right. If you want to be a part of that, let's all kneel who are able and have a closing prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Your word, unlike other books, has the power to transform us. It is a miracle, Lord. The other planets and the other angels and all of the unfallen beings, Lord, can see that we are neglecting the greatest gift. That we are, like C.S. Lewis said, we're far too easily pleased. Lord, forgive us for that. Forgive us that we are far too easily pleased. Help us to see that all of these distractions, all these off-ramps on this express way to heaven that you want us on and that you've placed us on. All these off-ramps, Lord, are just deceiving us. 
They're just distractions and deceptions. And they lead us into side streets with potholes and back alleys. Lord, please help us to see that the on-ramps back to, or for some here maybe initially, a first relationship with you can be exciting, it can be engaging, and Lord, it can be fulfilling. In fact, Lord, we know that we can only find peace from you. Your son Jesus said that the peace he leaves us is not the peace that the world gives, where we count on being having enough money or having a secure enough job or having good health, but it's a peace that passes all understanding. Lord, I ask for a special blessing on the people that are here tonight, and thank you for the people that are tuning in on live stream or watching the recording. We ask for you to bless us in a special way with this one request in particular. Lord, you said that you would bless us and reward us in an amazing way if we diligently seek you. I pray that you would give us the desire to do that, Starting now, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.